For the past seven years I have been presenting videos in front of this cupboard, but until now I haven't opened it and shown you the collection I keep inside. <laughs> I'd start with the most dramatic looking of my fossils. This is a Mosasaur tooth. It comes from Morocco. I can't tell you exactly what species of Mosasaur it is because A, I didn't find it myself, and B, there are a lot of Mosasaur species that come from Morocco. But uh, Mosasaurs, interestingly, were at the very beginning of paleontology being recognised as a science. They were discovered by Georges Cuvier alongside the River Meuse, and that's where we get the name Mosasaur, the reptile from the River Meuse. And their modern relatives include snakes and monitor lizards. Another very exciting fossil that I have is this. It's a tooth, again, from a dinosaur in the Spinosaurid family. We can compare it to a modern crocodile tooth. It's got a very similar structure, it's conical, pointed at the end, it doesn't have serrations. So from this we can deduce that uh, this is Spinosaur or Dinosaur, probably Baryonyx, but there are a few other contenders, probably uh, had a very similar diet to a modern crocodile, so they'd have eaten things like fish predominantly, but still capable of having larger land living prey. Another interesting fossil that I have is this. It's amber fossilized tree resin with insects inside it. In fact, the ancient Greek word for amber was electron, and we get the word electricity from this because amber has a uh, the propensity to be charged with static electricity. Now there's another item I have in here, a lot like amber. It's formed in the same way, but it's not as old. This is called copal. It takes a few million years for amber to be truly fossilized. If I were to take an alcoholic solution, rub it on here, this would turn into a sticky liquid again. A lot of fossil collections have shark teeth. This is from a creature called Megalodon, Carcharodon or Carcharocles Megalodon. The jury's still out on whether it's a genus of its own. I personally think it's more likely to be its own genus. But anyway, this is from a creature called Megalodon, and the name means big tooth. And the reason why fossils like this are so common is because sharks, and including a lot of dinosaur species, would have a constant conveyor belt. They were designed to be used and in the process get lost, but they'd be quickly replaced by another tooth. Crocodiles have a similar thing as well, that's how I've got a crocodile tooth, that was acquired in Madagascar, by the way. Like a lot of other collections, I have ammonites, this one. You can clearly see the chambers which the ammonite in life would have filled with water to make it sink, and or to rise it would have ejected the water and it could shoot out the water if it wanted to locomote. I also have a small geology collection in here as well. Here's a, uh, a dendritic stone from Solenhofen. This isn't a fossil, it looks like some kind of leaf but actually there was a fissure, likely underwater, where one substrate of a different kind of geological origin would bubble up and it would expand in a sort of little fractal structure whereby fractals are a single shape repeated on an infinitesimally smaller scale but getting larger as well, rather like a snowflake. Of course I also have insects in my collection. I'm particularly fond of the beetles. I'll show you them up close to the camera. Here we have an Australian unicorn beetle, Asian giant water beetle, South American longhorn, here's a stag beetle, and a Japanese emerald beetle. And there was a scientist called Haldane who was once asked by a clergyman 
what does studying the natural world tell you about God? And his response was that God has an inordinate fondness of beetles, because certainly among insects they are one of the most varied groups of animal on earth. This feather I acquired at my time at college, it's from a flightless bird called Aria. Uh, the Victorians called it the South American ostrich, although I believe now it's uh, kept in a different genus to the, to the ostrich, so it's got its own name. But back then it was called Struthia Rhea, and you can tell it's a flightless bird because just how light the fibbles are. They have no real hard structure, say compared to this, this pheasant, which, let's face it, the pheasants aren't the best flyers, and it's a bit old so they're sort of coming apart now, but it's much more streamlined than this feather from a flightless bird. A few years ago I was in my garden and I found this. The UK was going through a drought at the time and this poor frog was completely emaciated, not a drop of water on its body. Amphibians have taken a bit of a knock in recent years. Climate change is resulting in less rainfall but also there's the risk of chytridiomycosis and ranavirus, two diseases which are severely damaging amphibian populations. And here are three stone tools. And they all had different uses. This one would have been used to scrape meat from the skin of an animal which could probably then be used as clothing and these two would likely have been used for cutting meat and they've been so well cut in fact this one is completely flat and and you can tell that it was heated just before cutting from these ripples in stone so fantastically cut to this specific shape. And these, these weren't bought from a shop, these were just found. There are some parts of the world, including the UK, I think uh, these were found in, in one of the southern counties, where you can just find them lying around. Here's a trilobite from the genus Calimene, somehow left behind by the history of evolution. They existed from the Cambrian explosion up until the Permian, so that would be about 545 million years ago, all the way to just before the time of the dinosaurs, about 250 million years ago. And after that, there's not a single trilobite species. In fact, 95% of all life was wiped out during that extinction event, even more life than what was wiped out when the meteor struck and wiped out the dinosaurs.